feedback and input that helps us uh, design the sessions. You can practice writing the questions at any time if you have one. This is practice. Um, I won't share it with the, with the group. It's fine. <laughs> um, let's see. I have a couple of slides that um, just to show you who's um, participating in the member economic participation um, workshop. Uh, there's about 30 co-ops so far who are signed up. We don't actually know um, if all of them are participating in the call tonight. Well, we haven't quite done the cross-correlation, but these are the co-ops that um, have registered for the workshop so far. And um, uh, in addition, I want to show you a little slide about about C-Build. And um, let's see, is that not coming up yet, is it? Well, you know what? I'll show those at the end, Marilyn, if we have a few minutes. I also wanted to just point out that the um, that the files that we're using tonight are available in the file repository, and that people who are um, participating in the workshop have access to those. And right now, I'm trying to just get you back on course here, Marilyn, with your setup. There we go. There I'm. I feel better now. <laughs> Marilyn, may I turn it over to you to start the start the session? Yeah, you sure can. Uh, I want to also thank everyone for for coming and welcoming you. Um, I've invited uh, four people from four different food co-ops to join me uh, tonight in this presentation. Uh, they will be sharing a few stories from their own cooperatives and how they have um, implemented. Um, the member economic participation. Um, one of those uh, people is Audrey Thier. She is from the Wild Oats Co-op in Williamstown, Massachusetts. You want to say hello, Audrey? Hello. Another is Elka Malkus from the Wedge Co-op in Minneapolis. Hello. Uh, Wayne Schmidt from the St. Peter Food Co-op in St. Peter, Minnesota. Hello, everyone. And Terry Appleby from the Hanover Co-op in Hanover, New Hampshire. Hi. Hi, Terry and all. Thank you all uh, for joining me um, in this presentation. I'd like to look at the desired outcomes on uh, page two, and these are the, the ideas that we're going to try to cover tonight, that uh, co-op directors understand the co-op's economic relationship with its member owners, uh, that you understand the role, challenges, and types of equity, and you understand patronage refunds as a mutually beneficial tool for the co-op and its members. It's a lot to cover in one night. Um, I hope that many of you have been able to read the advanced materials uh, that we provided, or if not, that you'll read them afterwards. Uh, I want to make particular note of the note at the bottom, and that is that uh, I and none of the people who are presenting are um, legal or accounting professionals. We intend to offer you our, our best understanding, um, but it would not be prudent for you or any co-op to make uh, decisions based solely on the information from this seminar. It would be wise to seek uh, legal and accounting advice for any specific decisions that you may want to make. Um, the, next, I'd like to look quickly at the outcome for tonight. Um, we're going to look first at the overall economic relationship between the members and the cooperative. Then we're going to look at specifically uh, member share investments as a tool for capitalization and then member economic benefits. So first looking, uh, moving on to uh, slide number four now, Mark, um, looking at ownership. This shows just ownership for any kind of business, that owners provide capital, they control the business, and they uh, accrue benefits from the business that they own. But on the next slide, we'll see there are some specific uh, benefits, uh, some specific features of cooperative ownership that are unique. For example, the members own the cooperative on a democratic basis, one member, one vote as opposed to um, having control based on the amount of their investment. 
They also benefit on the basis of how much they used the cooperative instead of how much they invested in the business. And members control their, their business that they own together through an elected board of directors, which determines how surpluses are allocated. On the next slide, um, a few things that I want to point out there are that we're going to be talking tonight about consumer-owned uh, cooperative. And one of the unique things about a consumer-owned cooperative is that members are the source not only of capital and control of the cooperative, but also sales. So this uh, allows uh, consumer co-ops to have uh, very uh, make very strong linkages between the prosperity of the co-op and of the member and allows the, a very close relationship to exist where the co-op designs services that are um, closely aligned with what it is that the members need. Then if, if the co-op does that effectively, then the member's patronage provides the co-op with what it needs. So it creates a very uh, symbiotic and mutually beneficial relationship. One way that a co-ops can assess their strengths and weaknesses of that relationship is by looking at how much and in what ways do members trust the cooperative and how effective and to what extent does the co-op act as an agent for the member's interest. Those two questions are a, a little bit beyond what we're going to go into in detail tonight, um, but there's a very good article that's referenced there at the bottom of the page uh, that um, many co-ops are finding to be very, very helpful in understanding um, and providing guidance for their cooperatives. On the next slide, we have the third of the seven cooperative principles, member economic participation. And that's where most of the ideas uh, come from for the seminar tonight, that members contribute to the capital of their cooperative. Now that's in the first bullet there. That that capital is, um, at least part of that capital is the common property of the cooperative, that members receive limited com uh, compensation, if any, on that capital, that members invest in the cooperative not in the way that they would invest in the stock market in order to speculate in hope of a return. People invest in a cooperative because they want to make use of it. So the reward in a cooperative is the benefits are subscribed on the basis of use and not on the basis of investment. And then the last bullet talks about how surpluses uh, are allocated uh, through the board of directors. Uh, in these three ways, developing the cooperative, um, either by setting up reserves or um, investing in strengthening and growing the cooperative to increase the level of services or the facilities or the ways in which the cooperative can serve the members, um, returning a portion uh, to the members providing patronage dividends to the members in proportion to their use of the cooperative, and uh, lastly, by supporting other activities uh, that are approved by and, and benefit the members. On the next slide, uh, we take a look at why members invest capital in their co-op. And that goes back really to the idea that members uh, invest in the co-op because they want to use its services. They see that the co-op offers something that they need and want. And members realize that businesses need capital and that business owners provide capital. And so by investing in their co-op, they do so because they trust that it will be in their own interest as well as in the interest of other members. So one of the things that co-ops need to do to be successful is understand and balance the economics of ownership with the principles of democracy. It's not a common structure. It's not one that people um, in our society naturally understand or have learned a lot about in, in school or in their lives. 
So co-ops really need to find ways of communicating effectively this unique structure. Balancing the needs of the members and the needs of the business that those members own. I think I'll just pause here, Mark, and see if there are any questions at this point. Uh, none yet, Marilyn. Okay, sounds good. Well, then we'll just move, keep moving right ahead. And for those of you who are listening in, feel free to write down your questions and send them on in. Jumping on two slides then, Mark, the next one was the slide for questions. Mm -hmm. Do I have it right? Member share investments? <laughs> uh, you know, this is the point where I should probably say I le live deep in the woods of Vermont <laughs> and I have do not have high speed access, so I can't tell for several seconds whether you have it right or not. I'm on member share investments, Marilyn. How's that? Excellent. Excellent. Um, this is uh, where I'd like to invite uh, Wayne from St. Peter to talk a little bit about what, what they did. Um, the reason that I asked Wayne to participate in this is that the St. Peter Food Co-op has um, outgrown its facility and its needs to, to um, be able to provide its members with more services and more products that they want and they need to be looking at how they can do that in the future. And in thinking about that, and how they were going to accomplish that, uh, they looked at member equity as, as uh, one of the tools to help them accomplish that and uh, have recently changed their system. So Wayne, maybe you could uh, tell us a little bit about what you've done there at St. Peter. Um, yes, yeah, so we've got, uh, I guess my uh, portion here is the how and the why of, of what we did. I'm just going to reverse those and address why and uh, you did a little bit already in the fact that uh, that uh, we needed a new store sales were increasing it was getting crowded and customers were demanding more products and services and uh, we had a, a market study done back in 2005 by Pete Davis and that kind of pointed in the direction of the need for a new store so uh, we began to move in that direction and uh, went through a variety of uh, workshops and uh, and uh, presentations and uh, one of the one of the topics that or one of the words that kept popping up was that we were we were uh, preparing our store for the future and it got to be kind of a, a funny thing because uh, every time we would we would get stumped we would end up someone would end up saying well we're preparing for the future and we did realize that as, as funny as it got to be it was really true uh, we were looking down the road a long ways not just three to five years we got to a point where we uh, we realized that we need to start moving on this, and uh, uh, we realized that being board members, we're always doing a balancing act between satisfying the members and satisfying the co-op. And by leaning on the membership side of the equation, I think sometimes you you provide the members with all the things that they want want at the expense of the, the bottom line, and oftentimes that's sort of a, a short-term solution to a problem. If you lean on the co-op side a little bit, then of course you can increase profitability and it's more of a long-term benefit so we thought well we're doing this balancing act we're going to have to lean on the co-op side a little bit and start um, putting all this this together for a new store uh, we started to uh, look at some of the financing options and uh, there's conventional loans and some support from the city hopefully and uh, we could uh, produce investor shares and a membership loan program as well as increasing the member owner equity requirements. We had a, a uh, what we used to call a membership fee, but we've gotten out of that mode now. It's a, it's a owner member equity requirement of uh, $200. And we decided that it's been, not $200, excuse me, it was $80. And we decided that's been uh, at that for a long, long time. We needed to increase that. So we, we looked at... Uh, inflation I guess and, and we came up with a figure about 180 is what it would be worth today and we rounded that up to $200 and we provided a bunch of different different payment plans for our members to uh, to use you know, ranging all the way from uh, paying the full amount to uh, what we call our gentle payment payment plan which is 
spreading it out over seven years. So we made it very, very affordable to all of the members to increase their equity requirement. Like I mentioned, uh, a couple of the things we needed to do was, was get the notion of the word member out of our mind, and we started referring to them as member owners. And the uh, staff and the management at the co-op did a wonderful job, I think, of convincing everyone to refer to that when they talked to member owners. And we kind of got the uh, concept of the membership fee out of our minds, too, and that it's not a fee. It's, it's, it's an equity requirement, and you indeed are the owner of this business when you, when you provide that. And a lot of the changes that we, we went through, we, uh, we had a choice of, of increasing our member equity requirement as a way of raising money for this expansion. And we also had several other, other things we could do, too. We, we looked at uh, going to a patronage rebate system. Uh, we looked at eliminating discounts at the cash register and replacing them with in-store uh, monthly discounts. We looked at uh, putting together a community club card and uh, we changed our statute to a 308B. Fortunately, we had a lawyer do that, so please don't anyone ask me what it really means. I can tell you the outline, but, uh, but not the details. So basically, uh, by taking uh, the discounts away, we, we felt we needed to substitute those with other benefits. And so uh, we produced these uh, the monthly discounts and the community club card and the, the fact that that they're going to get a new store and that they are indeed owners of this new store. So it was important that we communicate these changes to the members and, uh, and be able to replace it with something that, uh, that they uh, felt had a benefit to it. One of the, the things we had to prepare ourselves for was questions from our members and uh, providing answers to those questions. We... Uh, we listed some of the questions we thought we would get from people, and we came up with the answers that we felt were the, the best answers. They were uh, answers that were, we emphasized the positive part of it. And the answers were pretty much the same, that we, as board members, we all knew what, how we would respond to questions so we wouldn't have anyone saying so-and-so said this or so-and-so said that. Another thing we did was we, since we were dealing with uh, patronage rebates and uh, discounts and 308B statutes and equity requirements and all that, we we kind of split up the experience, I guess you'd say, where some board members felt like they knew or understood one of these better than the other. And when we unrolled this uh, package of changes out at our annual meeting, it was uh, comforting for me, I guess, being uh, in a position to, to run the meeting that uh, if someone asked a question, that I didn't know an answer to, I could deflect it to someone else, or they would raise their hand and say, I know, I can answer that. So uh, we kind of uh, uh, split the expertise, I guess you'd say. We uh, communicated all these changes uh, in our newsletter, and we had in-store signage, and we had uh, a couple of, uh, actually I think three member uh, forums at the co-op where we had um, board members there at an evening sitting at a table and member owners could sit down and discuss and talk about whatever they want. So we, we made a, a huge effort to communicate all these changes to the members. And then we had our election and everyone voted on it. We sent out ballots and they voted on it. Uh, the election results came back and they were heavily in favor of these changes. So that was kind of exciting for us because then we knew which way to proceed. So now we, we have gone through uh, probably the first phase of our, our member owner equity requirement reinvestment uh, plan. And uh, we have to date, about a third of our members have stepped forward and contributed the, uh, the reinvestment share. Uh, we've increased our equity. Last I checked was we've increased at $61,605 from 30% of our members. Uh, in terms of a uh, $3 million store, which we're looking at, it's uh, not a lot of money, but I think it shows uh, it shows that our members are behind this by voting in favor of it, and it shows that they're committed to this project by coming forward and uh, 
and, and making their additional investment. I kind of like to think of it as a, uh, as a pyramid where uh, the owner members contribute the base of it. And if, if we can show that there's support and there's an interest in the financial uh, requirement fulfillment by them, it seems to make what goes on above the base uh, a little bit easier. And uh, I don't know how much time I got here, but uh, I've kind of uh, listed some points that I think were probably the uh, the three main points in this whole process we went through. Uh, one would be uh, would be alignment or agreement, and I feel that back years ago when we started talking about this, it seemed like the the board and the management team, everyone was pretty much in alignment over the fact that this is something we got to do. We've got to start raising our equity. We've got to start uh, getting our members involved. We've got to look at building a new store. Um, also, I might mention that one thing that we were totally in agreement with, with was that we really didn't know what we were doing. The second item uh, I think was important was the communication part uh, with the owners by taking away discounts and, and whatnot, we're showing them that we're replacing them with something of value, that this is not just a short-term thing, this is long-term, that we're, we're looking down the road a ways, and we want to see what this co-op looks like. We want to know what this co-op looks like in 30, 40, 50 hour, years in this, in this community. The, uh, another piece that I think was pretty important was the, the education part, about educating the members of what it means to be a, a co-op member and what their what their contribution is. I'm, I'm re reminded of an uh, article in the Cooperative uh, Business Journal by, uh, I think it's Paul Hazen, I think that's how you pronounce that. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of issues ago, he talked about uh, some of the things that's going on in the world these days and how co-ops are pretty accountable, held accountable for what they do, and they're pretty transparent in their operations, and that he called it a a teachable moment, and I thought that was a, a great line. And I feel like going through this process, we have opened the door to communication just a little bit wider to our members, and we're getting a little more dialogue back and forth, getting some response from them, and, and I feel like we're really kind of in a teachable moment right now. So the challenge for us uh, right now is to kind of is to continue this process and uh, take the next next step in our in our membership equity requirement program and get the rest of the members to to uh, dig into their pockets and and pay their share it it's it seems like being a member of owner of the co-op every business that I've ever known of has started somewhere along the line with with an owner digging in his or her pocket and putting up some money to make it happen and so that's what we really have to ask our Owner members to do. Um, Thank you, Wayne. I very much appreciate you sharing your your story. And there may be some questions that folks will will write in for you. Um, mm -hmm. But in the meantime, I, I'd like to ask Audrey to um, uh, talk about what you did at Wild Oats and how your story maybe um, is similar and and how it contrasts with what uh, St. Peter Co-op did. Okay. Well, uh, that was really interesting to hear because our story is very similar. All the elements are very similar except for one crucial detail and that's the timing. Um, I think we are something of a cautionary tale about, about the best time to assess and make changes to your, to your equity structure and, and Marilyn and I noted that that was sort of in, in keeping what there's a saintlier co-op and we're a wilder co-op. So. <laughs> so you're not, not uh, in suspense from the outset. I'll just say that all is well but we learned a lot along the way. So basically we're a 25-year-old co-op that began as a buying club, and for most of our history, like many of us, we were renters, but our sales steadily increased, and then they boomed as they did industry-wide, and we grew out of one small space after another. We moved around a few times, and we realized we needed to make a more fundamental change. So we considered a number of options, and we settled on renovating our own building, and we financed that, uh, unlike St. Peter's, which... which uh, made their equity changes beforehand, we financed it with a mortgage and member loans. And, oops, just lost my place here. And um, we also did this in the context of a very hearty sales growth, 14% uh, a year or so. So we bought our building, we renovated it, and we moved in in the summer of 2005. 
And we had talked for many years beforehand and during this about changing the underpinnings of our financial policies. Our member equity had, had really not changed since we had started. It was a sliding scale from $20 to $180. But for all practical, practical purposes, because people made the choice themselves, it was right around $20. And we had a registered discount at the time that we moved. It was 2%. It had been 5% earlier, and we had changed that. But we, we didn't make large changes for a variety of reasons, and not the least of which was that as renters, our member equity, before we moved, accounted for well over half our assets. So we as a board just didn't feel the urgency or as it turned out, the appropriate sense of foreboding about making that move. And once the renovations and the move were in full swing, we're, we were a small co-op, we were a small board, and we were pretty busy. So um, we were just occupied with other things, and sales increases continued. So again, we didn't really feel the pressure to make these other changes. But then in the fall of 2006, we expanded further. We installed an in-house bakery and better deli prep facilities. And we raised more member loans for these, but we also had cost overruns, as we did in the original building. And we needed to get a line of credit to, to deal with them. We couldn't, we couldn't just add to our mortgage with it. So by this point, we were really racking up the debt. And our member equity, now that we were owners and had this mortgage, was only 5% of our assets. Also, during the same time, our founding general manager, who had been with us for 24 years from the beginning, moved on, and we hired a new general manager. So in early 2007, we found ourselves with a new building, a new bakery, a new general manager, a lot of debt, and rather little equity. And so this sense of urgency overcame us, and we knew it was time to change our policies to catch up with all the other change that occurred. But we were, we were really nervous about going out to our members and asking them to change still more. We'd all undergone quite a bit of upheaval, and this was one more thing. And we also were concerned about making such a strong case for change by emphasizing or overemphasizing our need that we made people nervous about investing more, less willing to invest equity in something they feared was, was shaky. So we spent, like St. Saint, Saint Peter's um, process, we spent the spring of 2007 developing our options and communicating with members through letters. We produced various uh, uh, Q&A sheets and, and uh, information of various kinds. We tabled in the store, board members sat in the store and answered questions and promoted our um, informational meetings, of which we had two. And then uh, this climaxed in a, a meeting to change our bylaws, where we increased our equity um, to a minimum of $200. Also, as we just heard, um, that could be done over a, a many year time frame if needed. And we shifted to a patronage rebate system. And we took the time to explain what equity meant, both in general and to our financial health in particular. And we really worked hard to make the distinction between equity and dues and a co-op versus a buying club. And there were a lot of questions about that that came up. And a question by why just shopping in the store, um, if you didn't get a, uh, a rebate, uh, wasn't helping the store more because you were not taking from it. So we, we had to emphasize to people that, that their equity was our cushion. It was when, what made us stable and so we weren't going to be buffeted by changes in any given month or we could withstand unexpected things happening to us, equipment failures, etc. And the, the bylaw vote was overwhelmingly positive, though I will confess that the discussion had some pretty exciting moments and it, um, it, it was a, a very engaged discussion. But we, we voted in those changes and our bank was pleased enough with these and some other changes that occurred that they allowed us to restructure all of our high interest debt and that put us on still firmer footing. So we, we were, were making our way out of that, that very tight period. So all did go well in the end, but if we had made these changes before our move, like our more foresighted partners over there in Minnesota, rather than after, we could have been building the equity rather than simply acquiring debt during that crucial period. And we could have made a case for making these changes from a position of strength rather than from one of struggle. And we could have done it to pave the way for change rather than looking like we were piling more and more change on people and, and overwhelming them. But that being said, our, our members understood what was at stake and they accepted it. And so I would encourage co-ops who, like us, um, may find themselves after an expansion not having done everything they wanted to do with their with their financial structure, still go for it. I think people understand it at any point, and uh, it, it was successful for us. Thank you so much, Audrey. Um, 
we'll go to the next slide now and keep um, uh, an eye on the question queue. If there's some that come in for either of you, we'll we'll come back. Uh, but I want to talk. And Marilyn, just just let you know we do have some questions. So whenever you're ready. Okay. Let me just take a couple of minutes and then uh, a couple of uh, go through a couple of slides and then we'll take those. Thank you, Mark. Um, the next slide on uh, member shares one. Um, the second bullet, I just wanted to highlight that. I think both Wayne and, uh, and Audrey make this case very well, that the member share programs really have two goals. One is certainly to provide the COP with an adequate capital base. And the other is to create the sense of ownership among members, that the, that the uh, member owners really understand that they are owners, and as owners, they have a stake in the business and have uh, uh, some responsibilities that go along with that stake. Some of the advantages of uh, member shares as capital is that it is not taxable to the co-op. It can be very low cost to accumulate, and it can provide a base to leverage debt capital. I think Wayne talked about that very well when he talked about his pyramid, that with that base, they'll be able to leverage their, their bank debt, and that many people providing a relatively small amount uh, $200 each is not a lot to finance a grocery store, but you put them all together and it can provide that base uh, that demonstrates member support. And the next slide uh, is a little bit more on member shares. Um, another um, aspect of member shares, as both of these co-ops have pointed out, is that they are, are and can be flexible that they change as the needs of the business change. Um, be careful never to create the sense among your members that they uh, that the capital needs of the co-op will never change, and so that they are good for life. Um, talk about it in terms of fair share or your current equity requirement. But for co-ops that have been around uh, 30 years and more. Uh, you know that your capital needs change. As Wayne mentioned, inflation makes the capital that has been in invested less valuable than it was when it was invested. So allow, a uh, create a structure that allows that to change over time. And if it is an amount that is challenging, uh, both these costs uh, talked about their payment plans. Um, we suggest not too many payment plans because that can be confusing to members, but do have the, a payment plan that is gentle that allows members who really struggle with that amount to still participate um, and just pay in over a longer period of time. Uh, lastly, I just want to talk about the refundable nature of shares. Part of the reason they're not taxable is they're not income to the co-op, they're, they're investment. Um, the money belongs to the members. They invested in the co-op as long as they want to use that investment. And that share is refundable when the co-op uh, wants to leave. We do advise, though, that you have a policies and procedures in place that allow you uh, to restrict that re refund in, in cases that would be necessary to protect the co-op. Um, I think I'll stop there, Mark, and, and let you uh, bring in some of the questions that we have. Okay. Or you might want to slide 15 while we do that. Okay. Gave me there. All right. So um, uh, this is questions. First question is uh, on member perception around patronage refund and let's say other capital capital issues. Uh, is member perception uh, set in concrete or moldable? Would you say? Maybe that would be a good question to go to. Audrey and Wayne from their own experience there at their two co-ops. Well, we certainly banked on it being moldable or or we would have failed because, you know, people people do get used to the structure they have, the benefits they get and and you you need to make sure that you explain over and over what what co-op ownership means so that people don't have a sense that something is being taken away from them as opposed to their business that they own is evolving and needs to get onto a um, stronger footing to either expand or to deal with an expansion or for whatever reason. 
Um, but we did find that we, did, we spent a lot of time preparing materials and doing question and answer sheets and um, sitting and talking to people and lobbying them individually to try to to try to make it seem that you try to make them understand why this was still a benefit to them that the co-op's existence was the main benefit to them. Wayne, any comment on that? Uh, right now at our co-op, in terms of patronage rebates, we, we've got the uh, the legality to uh, to declare them, but uh, we haven't we haven't yet. But I I think that it comes back to this this education and just just keep you just got to keep uh, pushing at it that uh, what it is to be an owner member and and that the patronage rebate. Uh, I like the way Maryland puts it, where where a, a discount. At the cash register, gets to be sort of a sense of entitlement. People think they, that they they just should get it all the time. Where if the difference, and you need to communicate this and, and let your member owners know that patronage refunds really kind of create a mutual benefit between being an owner and the store. So it's it's uh, it's an education piece as, as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. um, so this next question um, uh, is regarding. Um, who that if the board needed to to have a vote of the members and Audrey I heard that you were making bylaw changes and had a member vote um, and just correct me if I'm if I have that wrong and Wayne did you uh, did you need a vote of the members or or was your member education process just to help people understand where you were going the member education process was was to let the members understand where we were going and we did we did have to have a vote and I don't recall how many ballots we got, but uh, we got a fair amount of, of owner members voted, and they voted overwhelmingly in favor of it. And so, uh, yes, it was uh, it was something we had to do, and then it, it was it was the the kind of situation where we we knew if this passed, we we sort of knew where we were going to proceed, but we never really thought about what we would do if it didn't pass, and. Uh, so, so when it did, I guess we were pretty delighted. But uh, you know, that's something we should have done was would have, was to have a plan B. I guess plan B would have been just go back to the same old, same old, if you will, uh, rather than uh, than uh, try to proceed. But uh, but uh, yeah, it was uh, it was uh, uh, thrilling for us to to have a huge majority vote in favor of these changes. I think um, additionally, I'd like to say that it depends on the the co-op's bylaws. Uh, that determines what what members vote on and what things the board can decide. Re regardless of what's there, I think it's important that you are that that the board proceeds knowing that it has the support of the members. Um, if even if the members uh, aren't required or obligated to to vote on it, if the board can decide, you would only want to do that having some way of knowing that the members are in favor. Because if they're not, uh, you won't be able to to implement the change in the in the membership, the, the growth in the equity, and uh, not only that, but you may lose some members who would decide to leave. So, I, I think it's um, in both of these cases there were bylaw changes that required um, that had to be made in addition to just changing the amount of equity. So I'm not sure if if it would have required member vote just to change the equity amount. Both of these clubs made make bigger changes that did require bylaw change and that required member vote. Mm -hmm. But you certainly want to have member support. How about another one, Mark? Uh, let's see. There was a request that um, if if Wayne and Audrey would be willing to share their question and answer sheets and some of their education materials that they developed. And if if so, if you would send them to me, Wayne and Audrey, and I can post them in the file repository for the workshop. Sure. Okay. All right. Um, there was a question of did either of you two have family memberships that needed to be changed to uh, single and if so how was that received? All of our memberships are household memberships no matter how many people in the house. Mm -hmm. Yeah ours are, are the same there it's one one household one member one vote one household. Um, we did have to rewrite some language in our policies in regard to uh, membership refunds in preparation for for uh, any members that uh, wanted the refunds back, and and we've got some language now that we're dealing with that says something to the effect that uh, for every 
one member refund, we have to have at least two new members. And uh, every every month we approve a few member refunds, but every month we also have anywhere between 10 to 40 uh, new members. So uh, we've never we've never had a situation where we've we've had a run on membership and had to pay out more than we took in. Hopefully that'll continue in the future. And did you uh, did you have members who uh, withdrew their membership because of the changes that you were making? We were undergoing such a period of change that we had had a few people pull out, not specifically because of you know because of the perceived idea that everything was changing all at once, but but just a handful. I, I would say that that this was though it might have been something that tipped the balance for for a couple of people, this was not uh, a big problem and, and our membership continues to grow and and pretty much everybody has ponied up with the change. We, our member numbers are very comparable to what they had been. Yeah, our membership is continuing to grow too. Most of the uh, member refunds that we deal with at our monthly meetings are people that are, are moving and they're going to be out of state and they'll never be back. and. And this time around, we did have, because of the changes we made, we did have a few um, disgruntled members who who decided to uh, to uh, ask for their their money back. Uh, and then the timing with all the the high prices and gas right now, because we're sandwiched between uh, a, a large town and Minneapolis, we had a fair amount of uh, members that lived in Mankato, which is 12, 15 miles away from us, and. Uh, some of them just decided that uh, it was too much to drive over here with the gas being like it is and uh, and the cost and everything. So uh, they asked for their memberships back. But uh, you, we haven't had a, a tremendous amount of people that were real upset over it. I should say that we we try we spend a lot of time in our board meetings talking about how much to raise the equity amount by equity requirement by because we were concerned that if we went too high we would. Uh, one of the charges that's sometimes thrown at us is we're elitist, we're more expensive, you know, we're not, uh, we're not for everybody, and we don't want that perception. And we were worried that if we set it too high, if we really use the calculation, um, how many members we had, getting ourselves to a, you know, an ideal amount of a percentage of our assets being our equity, um, we would have raised it far too high. So we we decided that we wanted to make up the difference between. The current number of members. We wanted to go out and do a member drive and set our set our equity requirements low enough that we could still attract new members and not have people um, start to think of us differently. Mm -hmm. so one, of the things, one of the things we looked at too. We we, we uh, had a a uh, retreat with Bill Gessner and and uh, he's the numbers guy and uh, a certain percent of this financing for a new store had to come from. The members in terms of loans or investment shares and a certain percent from um, member equity uh, requirements and uh, so we kind of looked at that percent too and realized well we'd have to raise it X amount we've got so many members that have to raise it X amount to get to that point and then we had some discussion too about about uh, this fear of becoming sort of an elitist place or if we raise the equity requirement too high people are gonna think oh that's a pretty they're pretty uh, got their heads in the clouds over there. I don't know if I want to get involved with those guys, you know. So we kind of had to do a balancing act there too. We didn't want to appear to be too too snobbish, but at the same time, we had to raise it up uh, high enough to uh, to get what we need to to move forward. Mark, I wonder if you'd go back to slide 14 here while we're talking about this issue of how much. And it's important that that is a strategic decision. That it starts with the. Um, the co-op's capital needs, and it doesn't start with how much do we think people want to pay, but what is it that the co-op needs, since we know that the co-op exists to serve the members' needs, and if if we do that well, they'll see that we are meeting their needs, and so they'll they'll understand it. Now that is that doesn't mean that's the last thing you consider. That's just the starting point. So that's what um, what Audrey was referring to when we looked at the the asset base of the co-op and how and what an appropriate percentage might be for member equity. It was about, um, I believe it was about $500 each. Um, so that was the starting point and then 
we worked back from there saying, okay, uh, that may not be possible. What else can we do? But the starting point is the capital needs of, of the business. I think with that, it might be good for us to, to move on. Um, so look uh, just uh, quickly at slide 17. Um, Wayne mentioned this, uh, but do be careful about what language you use. When you're trying to change the perception and the understanding of members as owners, uh, you want to be particularly careful about your language. Um, careless language can really interfere with members understanding what their role is as owners of the co-op. Um, with that, I'd like to move, uh, shift us to member economic benefits. And uh, that would put us on, on slide 20. So we've talked a lot about the equity side of the equation, and now we're going to talk about the benefit side of the equation. And the goal here is to have benefits that members love and that strengthen and sustain the co-op. And our hypothesis, and uh, we've got a couple of co-ops that are going to just talk about their programs, is that patronage refunds are an economic return that members love and that strengthen and sustain the co-op. Uh, why patronage refunds? On uh, slide 21, uh, they do create that mutually beneficial relationship with owners that we were talking about before. Um, both the co-op and the members prosper. The members know and trust that the co-op isn't going to profit off of their business because the surplus is returned in proportion. And it engages members in paying attention to how the co-op is doing. It makes use of a cooperative advantage. The tax codes in, in our country were, were created after co-ops had been doing business and understanding that their role was as a buying agent for their members and uh, using patronage refunds. So the tax code in, incorporated the idea of ownership on a cooperative basis, and it and created an advantage for cooperatives. Um, a real advantage is in the um, tax, uh, being able to minimize or uh, uh, significantly reduce the tax obligation of the cooperative. And another is uh, to be able to build um, capital to build equity through uh, non-taxable non accumulated profits. Uh, so we'll, I'm going to stop here and, um, and ask our guests on, uh, who are going to be talking about uh, patronage refunds to talk uh, on the next slide. Um, we, first we have uh, Terry Appleby from the Hanover Co-op in Hanover, New Hampshire, uh, who's going to talk a little bit about how um, Hanover Co-op has used patronage refunds for many, many years, uh, and then a little bit um, about what what the uh, leaders at Hanover Co-op are are thinking about in in um, looking at patronage refunds going forward. They're looking at maybe making some changes, and I thought it would be useful for us to hear how they're thinking about it. So, Terry. Thanks. Um, as you mentioned, uh, the patronage refund system at Hanover has a long history, and it dates back uh, decades, and uh, therefore has been, become somewhat institutionalized uh, and become an expected yearly benefit of membership, uh, something that um, is not always uh, to our benefit and sometimes actually uh, blurs the uh, idea of, of membership or of ownership in that members look at the benefit of belonging to the co-op as economic rather than in other ways. And uh, our board uh, in uh, several of the past uh, few years have had uh, conversations with management about uh, this uh, benefit and the way to think about the patronage refund, that it's not the reason that the co-op exists, 
that there are that, that there are many other uh, good reasons, and that the the Passion Retreat Fund is merely an expression of the co-op's good uh, fortune, and um, uh, but but not the, the only reason for the co-op to exist. As some members, and I should stress that it is some members uh, seem to think. The refund is uh, uh, seen as a, as a right of members by some members and is uh, even divorced from the concept of equity at times. Uh, in fact, yesterday I had a long conversation with a member about her rights of a refund. And when I tried to introduce the idea of members contributing to the capital of the co-op, she claimed I was only, uh, you know, using rhetoric, and I, when in fact I was quoting the third cooperative principle, read it directly off my wall. So, um, you know, uh, there is that uh, 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 kind of deep-seated uh, feeling among some members that co-op exists only to provide this little benefit and that uh, if the co-op doesn't deliver that on an annual basis, then, it, then it's nothing better than the typical uh, local chain supermarket. And our board has gone to great lengths talking about this issue at annual meetings, writing articles in the newsletter, talking with members about that. And I think for the most part, a great majority of our members think about the co-op as a community asset, as uh, in their ownership role, but uh, but there is an undercurrent that uh, that the expectation of patronage refund uh, uh, provides. Uh, at Hanover, for many years, the, the patronage refund was paid out in cash, 100% uh, in cash. At times, uh, that was the case, even when capital uh, expenditures were needed. Uh, the, the refund was paid out. Uh, we had uh, most of that time one store and um, uh, oftentimes capital expenditures were put off for years. We had uh, uh, not the best equipment and so forth and um, but uh, we delivered a three or four or sometimes even a 5% patronage refund. So we even enhanced the kind of idea about uh, the expectation of cash rather than ownership. Uh, however, as the capital needs and rising expenses, uh, especially about around labor and, and market forces, uh, trimmed net earnings as a, as a percentage of sales, building equity capital became and has become more problematic. Uh, our own uh, co-op capital reserves are set by our bylaws of, uh, as not less than 10% of the net earnings and uh, for many years have been calculated as the percentage of net earnings attributed to non-member sales. So any of that, uh, about 20, which is about 23% of our uh, sales are to non-members. So about 23% of our of our uh, annual net earnings um, become our capital reserves. The refund is calculated by taking the current year operational savings and we have to subtract out the New Hampshire business tax and, and uh, the retainage by our bylaws and other taxes on those retained earnings. And this leaves the co-op with a small gain in capital each year uh, compared with our, um, uh, with our total revenues. Um, for the uh, for the co-op, the distribution of hundreds of thousands of dollars every year is mixed. Uh, some portion of the uh, of the refund goes back into the local economy, and um, 
including back to the co-op in, in the form of further patronage. So there's a, a community and social benefit to, to the patronage fund. Uh, and, uh, another major community benefit is, is that around 4% of our total uh, comes back to us every year to the Hanover uh, Consumer Cooperative Fund, which is an endowed fund that supports our charitable community work. Uh, but from an operations perspective, the payout of the refund causes a drain on cash each year that when it's distributed to the members. So we we annually kind of supplement those payments with our line of credit. The small amount of reserve capital keeps liquidity at a fairly low level. And uh, therefore we have to operate on a on a very efficient level to keep things running. Uh, the shortage of working capital means that our cash inflows have to be steady and dependable. Uh, you know, we have to keep people coming through the door and buying groceries and turning those over at a pretty rapid rate. And we've been able to do that uh, from years of good uh, operations. But, um, but uh, there are crunch times that, uh, that, the, that, that giving out too much uh, money at one time causes. Uh, because of that, our board and management over the past several years have uh, decided that we would give back only a portion of the uh, of the refund in cash, usually it's 75% uh, for, for the past maybe five years. It's been 75% in cash, and 75 and 25% is given back to members as um, as additional shares uh, in the co-op. And we've asked the members to hold on to those shares to keep those in the co-op. Uh, as uh, as equity investment, and they have uh, they've done that. Um, we have just a handful of members every year who complain about the fact that they get more shares. We try to talk to them about their ownership and their uh, the uh, you know the requirements of an owner to to the cooperative. Uh, sometimes they keep the money in the co-op. Sometimes they take it out. But all members have. A call on those shares. Um, so, uh, why are we considering a change? Um, for one thing, we have ongoing needs for working capital. Um, when we were a one store operation, it was not a problem to give out large amounts of cash uh, and keep the business running well. But when we decided uh, in 1996 to build a second store because of overcrowding, we had to go into a, quite a bit of debt. We didn't have a whole lot of equity to finance that project, but we did have efficient operations and, and some assets to leverage borrowing, and we went into debt and paid that off last year. But we would like to have more working capital to be more flexible to do things like expand and, and make capital investment and uh, enhance our co-op. So um, we're looking at a, at a way to uh, tweak the system to become more flexible and build uh, higher levels of reserves. Um, Harry, I yeah. appreciate that very much. You bet. Um, we'll, uh, We'll monitor questions and see what comes in there. In the meantime, I'd like to ask uh, Elka to talk about your structure at the Wedge. You've taken a little bit different approach to the retained portion. And could you describe that, please? Sure. And um, I just want to say that it's, this has been really fun. And I feel like I've learned so much just um, listening to people talk so far. Um, at the Wedge, we've been doing patron refunds for about 20 years. And before that, uh, like many, co-ops around here used to be, and maybe like some co-ops around the country still are, we never gave patronage refunds. Um, we gave discounts at the register. 
and I've been here a long time, and I do remember that uh, the, we had been losing money every year, and the first year we stopped having a discount, we made money. And the way we explained it to people when we made that switch initially, which coincided with a switch from a um, $1 membership requirement to a $10 membership requirement, now we're up to 80, um, the, what we told people was giving a discount at the register is giving away your profit before you know if you made any. And giving a patronage refund is a system whereby the co-op make sure once the books are closed and the year is done that they have a profit and then they determine how much is available to share with members. So explaining it that way I think really did help people understand it and of course you can't get 100% understanding. Um, our philosophy has been with our patriot refunds that the co-op of course our main objective is to provide goods and services to our members and we cannot do that unless we exist. So our first objective is to make sure that we are financially stable and sound enough that we are here this year and next year and for people's kids. So we have lots of members in here shopping with their families. You watch the kids grow up. Anyone that's worked at a co-op for 20 or 30 years knows that. And then those people come in and shop. And that's a really good way to help members understand that this is this is a community resource, and by making sure that the co-op is strong and exists, this can be here for you and for your kids and, who knows, for your grandkids, too. Um, so our first question is always, what are the store's needs? Um, for the first year that we actually made a profit, I think it was $3,608. And it was the first year in many years that we had made a profit. That was 20 some years ago. And we did give 100% as cash, but we have never given 100% as cash since then. Um, we, for the longest time, gave about 22% as cash. And um, we retained the rest of it. And we wrote a letter that goes out with every. Um, Patriot Refund check to members that explains we're retaining some of this and this is why we need it to upgrade our coolers, we need it to do a reset, we need it to build a new store, whatever happened to be the thing that was going on, or things that in general you need, which is you need to have money so that you can fix the roof. Um, and generally members understand that. We of course um, have a couple, like Terry was talking about, you know, we. I think we have now 14,000 members, and we, the last number of years, we've been refining this letter, so I think it goes over pretty well. We usually have fewer than 10 people call and say, you're holding my money hostage. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the money that um, on the Patriot Refund that we retain. So 100% of the profit that's attributable to members is allocated to patronage refund. Of that, a certain percent is distributed as cash. And legal, legally, you need to distribute 20% minimum as cash in order for 100% of it to be tax-free. So um, that's why we used 20 or 22% uh, in those earlier years. Um, the, the portion that we retain, uh, Qualified Pensions Rebate Equity Certificate, that's considered a form of Class B stock, and it um, we do not return that to members. So members have to buy, um, to be a member, you have to buy $80 worth of shares. One's your voting share and the other is your equity shares. If you move out of state, you know, we'll buy those back. We do have some provisions like uh, I think St. Peter was talking about but we haven't luckily had to use those. Um, but the Qualified Painters Rebate Equity Certificate, that's considered a different form of Class B. That is not refunded when a member leaves. And according to our bylaws, that's only refunded at the uh, pleasure of the board. And so the board has never decided to refund that. We retain that as equity. And it's in each member's name. So for example, last fiscal year, you know, I spent whatever amount of money I got a certain percent of cash and a certain percent 
was you know, on the computer in the database under my name as an increase in my equity. But it's not really my equity, it's joint equity, it's community equity. We all own it, it's a way to keep the co-op strong and keep the co-op functioning. Um, we do have provisions that if we saw a need, the board could determine to return that and they would return it as long as it's in some orderly fashion. In other words, it could be oldest first, it could be newest first, it could be alphabetical, whatever they wanted to do. But I always tell people, I frankly can't think of a reason why we would ever return it. And, you know, 99% of people are fine with that. Um, after our first, so we started doing refunds, I think, in uh, 1988 or 89, probably 89, 88 or 89. And in 91, 92 is when we did our first expansion. And one of the main things we did with that money that we retained when we determined, well, we're only going to give 22%, we're not going to give 100%, we used that to pay down our bank mortgage. We used it to pay down our debt so that we would be stronger and more flexible and ha uh, be better able to weather economic fluctuations in the future because our occupancy costs would be lower. And that has worked out really, really well for us. Um, we've been successful for many years and we're now at a point where We've got this little formula for determining what percentage of cash is the patron's refund, and that has to do with determining our excess working capital. So we figure out, you know, what's our current cash and our accounts receivable. From that, we subtract our accounts payable, accrued expenses, one year's um, principal and interest on any debt, and that's excess working capital. And then we have a little chart. If it's this amount to that amount, we give 25% of cash. If it's the next amount, we give 40% as cash. If it's the next amount, we give 60% as cash. From that, the board, uh, from that excess working capital amount, the board can also set aside, well, we know we're going to be expanding the warehouse like we did a few years ago. We have a perishables warehouse, and that's going to cost us, you know, we're going to self-finance, and it's going to cost us $500,000. I can't remember the amount. And so we're going to set aside that um as something we need to retain for the store. And then as a result, our cash portion was lower. Um, we do, we have occasionally had some problems with member expectations being raised, like Terry was talking about. So there were some years where maybe if the profit is higher or the percent is higher and someone gets a check one year for, you know, $102 and the next year their check is only $69 and they'll call up and they say, how come I didn't get as much money? And we just try to explain that it's a function of many things, one of which being how much profit is there, one of which being what percent of sales are to members, one of which being how much does the store need to retain to operate because we want to be here not just today and not just tomorrow, but we want to be here in the future. Um, and people generally people really understand that we had a little bit of trouble a few years ago when our when our co-op warehouse decided to sell out to UNFI so when Blooming Prairie sold out to UNFI and um, the co-ops got their equity back and a portion of the sale from UNFI and then that was determined by our accountant to be member sourced and so that added to the amount of money that was allocated to patronage refund, and people got pretty big checks that year. And then there was some explaining to do the following year when they weren't that big because there wasn't that extra infusion from outside, but it wasn't, we didn't really find it to be a problem. I think that's all I have to say right now. <laughs> Well, I have a question for you. Okay. <laughs> um, and the question is a is one that asks: uh, Wouldn't a perfect co-op have no patronage refund because it charged members precisely what their purchases really cost? To put it another way, isn't the patronage refund really similar to a tax refund, an illusory benefit? The patronage refund is a yeah we. We'll describe it sometimes as 
it turned out we overcharged you. Oops. And here's some money back. And that's why it's not taxable to the member as a member of a consumer co-op because it's a refund on their purchases. Um, and in, I, I, in a perfect co-op not have any refunds? I'm not sure because a perfect co-op still needs to set aside money for those capital expenses and for those unusual things like opening a second store. Um, but I guess if you priced absolutely perfectly and knew how much you would need, then there wouldn't be one. And luckily we're all human and we're not perfect. Thanks, Marilyn. Oh my goodness, I put her to sleep. Marilyn, you, your line might be muted. Uh, yes, I did. Sorry, I did mute it because I was doing a little typing, sorry. Um, yeah, I think it also has something to do with whether or not the co-op needs capital because patronage refunds represent a couple of different things. So one thing it, it represents is a surplus on uh, extra that you charge the, the members that you didn't need to charge them, but it also represents an opportunity to capitalize the co-op in a tax-free and interest-free way. It's the only kind of capitalization uh, that has that, that advantage and it can accumulate significant uh, capital for the co-op to be able to better serve its members. So if the co-op had no desire or no um, interest in better serving its members, then I think the question could be valid, but I haven't seen a co-op yet that didn't have uh, needs for capital or opportunities to provide uh, better services or services to more people. Um, what I'd like you to do though, Mark, is go to page uh, slide 25 and look at the um, a chart that sort of shows how all of this works. And we'll look at a couple of slides and we'll take a few more questions. Uh, slide 25 uh, shows the flow um, on an annual basis that first uh, the net income of the cooperative is determined as Elka mentioned, and then that is divided into that net income that's derived from member patronage, and that that is derived from non-members or non-patronage source income. So interest income, for example, isn't based on patronage, so it is not eligible for patronage refunds. So once the, that calculation has been made, uh, then there's a decision to make about the uh, amount that's going to be credited and allocated to member owners and that which isn't. As Terry mentioned, a lot of co-ops have uh, bylaws that require a reserve fund. Other co-ops have a choice to um, fund a reserve fund on an annual basis and can use the unallocated equity to do that. Other co-ops use the profit on non-member sales as the funding for their reserve accounts. So the first decision is of the profit that's eligible for distribution for patronage refunds, how much do we want to allocate? Then the next decision is of that amount that we're going to allocate, what percentage do we want to distribute? And the minimum amount you can distribute is 20%. And as Elka mentioned, um, it's if the co-op has needs and is looking to um, build capital, uh, that is probably the appropriate percentage to allocate. She talked about allocating 22% um, uh, and that was uh, designed to ensure that in total, uh, for on cash checks and whatnot, that it was a 20%. Am I correct on that, Elka? Yeah, great. just a little paranoia on my end of, and I never checked this out with a lawyer or CPA, but since I knew that the legal requirement from the IRS was 20%, I started worrying, well, what if, because a lot of people don't cash their checks, but what if when we were actually audited one day that not that much actually was ever cashed by members, would we be in violation? And so just to give us a little bump, I always did it at 22%. <laughs> I see. And, and you can also adjust that on your taxes the next year, and that's what some co-ops do if for uncashed checks, um, then the full amount of that distribution then would be taxable in the following year. So you just adjust your next year's um, returns to account for that. So the first decision being uh, what percentage of our member-based profit do we want to allocate for 
uh, patronage and second decision is what percentage do we want to distribute. You can see on this chart uh, where the tax implications are. In the green boxes, uh, that portion of the profit is taxable. The amount that's allocated to members, both the distributed and the undistributed amount, is not taxable to the members. Um, Mark did move ahead a couple of slides. I want to show um, next the table uh, that gives an example, uh, just following through on this same um, scenario. So in this particular example, the uh, co-op had 100,000 in taxable income. The um, first column there labeled no patronage refund allocation just shows the tax implication of that 100000 That would um, be a total cash outlay of, of 22500 which is all, all taxable. But for this, we're just assuming uh, a 20% tax bracket, um, approximately. And then the next columns show the steps we were just talking about on a, on a patronage refund allocation. In this case, we're assuming that 75% uh, of the sales were to members. And so 75,000 was eligible. Uh, this co-op chose to allocate 70,000 and uh, put 5,000 in reserve. That would be taxable. So they owe taxes on that uh, on that 5,000, and then they also owe taxes on the non-member sales and, and non-patronage sales. So they have a, a total. Um, uh, and then their their 20% um, patronage paid is 14,000 on the 70,000 at 20%. So they have a total cash outlay in this scenario of um, uh, significantly less than 18,500, less than the um, cash outlay in the previous scenario, uh, but also a significantly higher amount of cash that stays in their community. Um, so I think we would uh, be ready now to take some questions. Okay, we have some. Let's see, related. Um, how about is the individual patronage refund taxable? Uh, no, it is not taxable to the individual. Uh, as long as the individual is using uh, the products that they bought at the store were for their personal consumption. The co-op will have to file a form at the beginning of this process to, that indicates that 85% of the products that it sells goes to individuals for personal consumption. So the IRS considers that a, um, a non-taxable item, uh, a reduction that you were overcharged on your groceries and so the grocery store gave you uh, some of that money back. Um, it's money that you already paid taxes on when you earned it at your job, and so they don't tax it again. Okay. Um, and by the way, if, if you missed the instructions on how to submit a question, it's the little question and answer toolbar on the GoToWebinar Go to toolbar. And if it's not open, you hit the little triangle next to the letter Q and type in underneath enter a question for staff. Um, could you discuss the use of store certificates for a portion of patronage refunds? Yeah, the co-op uh, can distribute its uh, patronage refund through store certificate instead of by check. The only caveat that the IRS requires is that if the member prefers cash, that you give them cash. But the certificate um, system can be very effective. It can be less costly than um, distributing the checks. It can also uh, create a higher redemption rate for people to to turn in their certificates there. Um, and it also um, keeps more of the money in the co-op and flowing through the co-op. So it's, it's a, it can be a very good strategy. Um, most co-ops set an amount by below which they will not issue a check. So for instance, if your refund is going to be uh, less than $2, the co-op won't distribute a, a check. It's more expensive to to distribute it and mail it than it is worth. Um, of course, those those that share the profit is no longer eligible 
for reduction of taxes because you didn't distribute the 20 percent. Um, but it's still, in the long run, more cost effective. Um, stores that issue a certificate instead of checks seem to use a lower amount. Um, checks I've seen as high as $5, less than $5, they won't issue a, a check. Where certificates, um, I see that as a lower um, $1 or $2. So you can you can distribute more and get more money back into the hands of your members and uh, get more of it um, shielded from taxation using certificates. Thanks, Marilyn. Uh, here's another one. You ready? Yes. If a co-op has given a discount at the register and still managed to have retained earnings, is it reasonable to assume that if a patronage dividend amounts to less expense for the co-op than the prices may be lowered. Say that again, please. Okay. If a co-op has given a discount at the register and still managed to retain uh, to have retained earnings, is it reasonable to assume that if a patronage dividend amounts to less expense for the co-op, then the prices may be lowered? Um, assuming that a co-op has been operating profitably with a discount system, switches to a patronage refund system, might they be able to lower prices? Thank you. Is that the question? I think so. Okay. Um, you know, I think that that would be a discussion that you would really need to have in, in much more in depth than I can do right here. I'd need to understand more what the what the strategic issues were. Um, if a co-op is charging more than they need, uh, then certainly lowering prices may be the best option. Um, but keeping in mind that patronage refunds have a number of benefits for the co-op, including um, the being able to build uh, capital tax-free and interest-free, that it may not it may not be in the best interest of the co-op to do that. I just I don't have enough information in this to really give any advice on that. Oh. And I just want to this is Elk. I just want to jump in here. There's, you know, it's pretty important for co-ops like any business to make a profit. And if you're profitable, you can do many things. In addition to building your balance sheet, you can pay your people better and you can give them better benefits. And that is a huge benefit to members because happy staff and staff that stays around who know things, that's one of the great um, gifts that a co-op can give its membership is we have staff who know things, who can answer questions, who are engaged. And if you go into some chain grocery store, you're lucky if you can find some high school kid stock and shelves who doesn't know anything. So you know, having a profit enables you not just to build capital, but to do other things that make your store more valuable and that make it more valuable to the members. Thank you, Elka. Elka, Can I have take a, a quick question for you, Elka. Do you share the um, excess working capital calculation uh, with the members when you describe how it is that you arrived at the uh, amount that you're returning? No. Although if someone called me and asked me, I probably would. Okay. There's a question to Hanover and the Wedge uh, asking if either of you have uh, individual shares or household shares, one or the other or both. Elka, would you go first? Uh, we just have shares. You know, it's one person, one vote, and if you want your entire household to be able to use your member number, they certainly can when they shop, but there's only one vote associated with each member number, and each membership is an $80 stock purchase, mm -hmm. no matter how many people use the number. And Hanover has a somewhat funky system. I, I can't even, I, I don't even know if you want me to try to explain it, but uh, on each individual card, membership uh, on each individual membership, there can be two voting members as long as the 
uh, three shares of five dollars each have been bought. Um, so that so that two members can vote on one card. I, 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 this yeah, makes I, I up think you're right, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> so we might say that a best practice is a membership. Not. A membership is a membership. That there's not a, a variance. Uh, each membership has the uh, rights and responsibilities uh, that are associated with that membership, and there aren't different classes and tiers. And part of the reason for that is um, just what Terry is, is it's hard to explain otherwise, it's hard to figure out. And then also when those when households change and um, break up and move apart, uh, the co-op just really doesn't need or want to be engaged in those discussions about whose share is it. There's one, one name associated with the membership. That doesn't mean that no one else can shop and have their in the household can shop and give courtesy cards, but one, we recommend one, one membership, one share. We might have time for one more question, Mark. Well, um, how about the idea, uh, the, the question of are, are the things that you're talking about tonight different for older co-ops versus newer, more progressive co-ops? Uh, no, I don't think that they are. I think these, these are principles uh, and ideas that have been built from the, from the cooperative principles as far back as Rochdale in England in 1840s and they've been codified in the U.S. tax law. Um, they're, they're still very appropriate tools. These are practices that we're recommending for co-ops that are just forming today through the Food Co-op 500 program. We're um, getting close to the end, and I, I know that you want to um, get the evaluation up, so you might want to go ahead and end the seminar and, and have that come up so that people can evaluate. Um, I want to thank um, Audrey and Wayne and Elka and Terry very much for their participation. It was very helpful to have you all here.